Well, uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, on behalf of Peter Bergen, the uh, director of the National Security Studies Program, and Steve Cole, the president of New America, I want to thank you all for coming today. Um, very quickly, uh, not only for us here, but for those who are uh, on our webcast, we could have everyone in the audience take your cell phones now, turn them fully off for the purposes of the sound system, not just put them on vibrate uh, so that we uh, have no interruptions during the program. Uh, I'm Doug Olivant. I'm a uh, senior fellow here at New America Foundation. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today Miss Lucy Morgan Edwards. She's the author of The Afghan Solution, the inside story of Abdul Haq, the CIA, and how Western hubris lost Afghanistan. Um, a very provocative title. She's the former uh, political advisor to the EU ambassador in Kabul with responsibility for civil military affairs, narcotics, and security sector reform. During her seven years in the region, she worked for the UN in Kandahar um, at the height of the Taliban regime. So she has experience in both pre and post uh, 2001 Afghanistan. She worked as an election monitor uh, at the 2002 Emergency Loyal Jirga, was an initial researcher on transitional justice issues for the International Crisis Group, ICG, and a monitor on the currency exchange project with the Afghan Central Bank, and a correspondent for the economics, uh, for, I'm sorry, for the Economist and the Daily Telegraph. So a wide range of experiences in the region. Her ultimate job uh, in Afghanistan uh, was in 2005 as a country expert to the EU monitors of the 2005 Afghan parliamentary elections. Um, we look forward to hearing about her book today. Uh, Lucy, please come up. Thank you, Doug, for the introduction and to the New America Foundation for letting me come here today to, to talk to you. Um, let me just figure out how this slide thing works. <laughs> Um, I think it's forward like that. Um, I'm just giving you a bit of context on the book, really. Um, I, this is a picture of me in Kandahar when I was first there in the year 2000. I was there working on community development and water projects. Um, when I say community development, the projects were very much bottom up and involved um, directing aid through community forums that the UN had been working with in urban areas which later became known as the National Solidarity Program. I uh, thank you, Doug, for, for the introduction. I did a wide range of jobs. I, I had to actually leave Kandahar when the USS Cole was bombed in, um, August, was it August or October? It was October 2000. And I went back to the UK and returned to the region a year later uh, after September 11th um, and did those, those jobs. I'm not going to list them again. Um, but basically, my experience in Afghanistan changed in 2002 when I met the Arsala family. Uh, then I was given access to a very different side of Afghanistan to what most of the foreigners experienced uh, living in compounds and being embedded with the military. Uh, the Arsala family was a family of tribal elders who come from Jalalabad in the east of the country. And they, they, they were well known during the jihad because they were a family of seven brothers. Um, including Haji Din Muhammad, Haji Qadir, and Abdul Haq. And they'd been commanders during the Soviet anti-Soviet jihad. Um, I stayed in Afghanistan when the focus turned to Iraq, working as a freelance journalist and, and on the currency exchange, et cetera, et cetera. And my book deals not only with the Abdul Haq plan, but with the first five years of the war. Because just when everyone else left, I felt that I witnessed quite a lot of turning points, particularly in the political side of the intervention, that have contributed, I believe, to the current situation that we face today in Afghanistan. I'm just going to show you how we're going to structure the talk here. So I'm just looking at where we are today in Afghanistan, um, how we got there. I've, I have a piece on um, state building in the current International Review of the Red Cross publication conflict in Afghanistan, which is just coming out, although it's the December 2010 edition. Um, I don't want to go into too much depth about how we got there in terms of military strategy chosen, et cetera, et cetera, because I'm sure uh, a lot of you have um, examined that or have read about that in the press. But that is also in my paper in the, in the International Review of the Red Cross. I'm going to talk about what was the alternative to the military campaign that we, that we um, undertook in October. 2001, which is the Abdul Haq plan. Um, I'm going to talk about why it was ignored and what is, what, why it's important, why I believe it's important that we understand what it was and what is its relevance for today. 
So the, the, let's look at today in Afghanistan. Security situation. I think the bold attacks last week in, in Kabul, the suicide bombing on Dariliman Avenue, and last month on, on the US Embassy illustrate the difficulty for the US and other NATO countries in Afghanistan today. We're, we're told that it's most likely to have been the Haqqani network. Generally, security seems to be getting worse across the country with IED attacks, etc., up year on year, and the government finding it very, very difficult to hold areas outside of Kabul. The cost for the US alone has exceeded 500 billion US dollars. In terms of military progress, the ongoing justification is dismantling, disrupting, and defeating Al-Qaeda. But the metrics of success have been very much about numbers of Al-Qaeda and Taliban killed, especially as the military has moved away from a coin approach and towards capture and kill, which has had deleterious side effects, particularly uh, politically. We've also tried to weld an Occidental-style nation-state onto an essentially tribal society. Yet, the, the, the government has a highly centralized administration, barely operating in the regions, and which includes characters who perhaps have little interest in pursuing the kind of stability and reconciliation desired by the West. The last point is that the military strategy, strategy seems to have occurred entirely separately to what was going on politically. In terms of the West's exit, much of this is predicated on the idea of build-up of Afghan national security forces. However, this lacks, lacks a clear political strategy and is very, very expensive. For example, the Pentagon spent something like 39 billion US dollars over the last six years building up Afghan national security co uh, forces. And though the, the cost is pro projected to reduce from 13 billion a year to 6 billion a year, by 2014, we have to remember that the government in Kabul raises only two billion a year in taxes. So I, th I feel that the Afghan National S Security Force approach to exit is really a zero-sum game, and it, it seems to be the West's main focus. We, we don't seem to be looking at other options. In, in the year 2010, US General Flynn said, Eight years into the war in Afghanistan, our vast intelligence apparatus is unable to ask, answer fundamental questions about the environment in which US and allied forces operate and the people they seek to persuade. Taliban reconciliation, well, I think the events of the last couple of weeks have indicated that, uh, as well as the assassination of, of Rabani um, last month, has, has shown that, that this is not really going to happen anytime soon. The reconciliation also took off very, very late because of the U.S. Um, desire not not to um, to have a reconciliation process, and it's also very hard, I think, to to start this type of process when you're still fighting a war. It's very contradictory. So, why my interest in Abdul Haq? Ironically, Abdul Haq is a household name in Afghanistan, yet his name remains virtually unknown in the West possibly except among a few uh, people who were dealing with the, the Cold War, particularly here in, in Washington, D.C. However, he's, he's pretty unknown. When I talk to most people, they, they're kind of like, why are you writing about this guy? This seems to be a very esoteric subject. Um, but when I talk to most Afghans, particularly the slightly older generation, they know immediately who one's talking about. Abdul Haq was from a leading family of Gulzai Pashtun, he was one of seven brothers known as resistance royalty during the 1980s jihad. The family were based in the east and worked with the Hizbi Islami party of Yunus Khalis during the 1980s to eject the Soviets. Other commanders in the party at the time included extremist commanders Hikmat Yar and Jalaluddin Haqqani. Abdul Haq, who was a moderate, was the only Pashtun commander of any significance who eventually took the fight to, the city, to, the, uh, to Kabul, to the center of the regime which is where he realized that, that he needed to attack in order to put pressure on, on the Soviet regime. In Kabul, he was well known for his strategically excellent asymmetric operations, which included blowing a seven-story underground Soviet munitions dump at Karga, which is an event that some said turned the war. Despite this, he was relentlessly criticized by both the ISI and the CIA, who dubbed him Hollywood Hack and failed to provide him with the munitions he needed. 
He left Afghanistan after the fall of the communist government in 92, when different Mujahideen factions turned on one, on one another. I first became interested in Abdul Haq, actually after I left Afghanistan on my first visit, um, and after 9-11, when I saw, you won't be able to read this, but just to give you an idea, I saw this article in the London Evening Standard. And there was this commander, Abdul Haq, asking for the West not to bomb Afghanistan. And he was saying, I need to, uh, Tony Blair, you have to put the hand of restraint on George Bush not to bomb Afghanistan because I have a plan. And um, if you bomb, it's going to scupper that, essentially. Um, so the plan, very, f very few people realize that, that this was an alternative to what unfolded after September 11th and thereafter in the last decade over Afghanistan, in Afghanistan. This was an, Abdul Haq's plan was an internal solution. It was an Afghan alternative to the Taliban. And to assess this, I interviewed many of Haq's former commanders, other tribal leaders, senior Taliban, members of the King's Group, and lastly, two independent and private British and US efforts trying to get support for Abdul Haq and the ex-king with who he, whom he was doing the plan um, via US and British government agencies, particularly the intelligence agency, the White House, and, and various um, agencies in Whitehall in London. It's through the lens of those twin efforts that my book examines the intelligence failures of both the US and UK government policy since 9-11 and around, around the weeks of 9-11 as well. So what was this plan? So Abdul Haq believed that Afghans needed to have an alternative to the Taliban. He, he knew that the regime was becoming unpopular, and in the two years before 9-11, I would say three years actually, two to three years before 9-11, he ha held meetings in Rome, well there was the Rome process with the ex-king. Um, Abdul Haq became the commander of, of this group. And there were other meetings held in Istanbul and also in Bonn, attended by tribal leaders, by Haq's former commanders during the Jihad and the Taliban. The ex-king would be the rallying point around which disparate groups would coalesce. The plan depended on the Taliban collapsing from within. And by January 2001, Haq believed the regime was sufficiently unpopular to implode, that it was like a crystal which could be fissured and shatter at any time, at the right time. And he felt that by January 2001 that the time was right. The idea of the plan was to call upon and work with those members of the Taliban fed up with the regime. He did deals. He's, he was meeting not just in Istanbul and Bonn, but um, uh, in, in Dubai. He was meeting with moderate Taliban, many of whom had been his commanders during the jihad during the 1980s. These were men he could call upon and who had a level of trust with him. They'd become, many of them had become Taliban during the mid-90s when they saw the regime as a means of bringing stability. And some of these guys, by this stage, were actually even providing the bodyguard to Mullah Omar, some of um, Mullah Malang's commanders, who were, he was one of um, Haq's men. Many of his allies were embedded in the Taliban, in key positions of the Taliban military axis of Jalalabad, Gardaz, Ghazni, and Kabul. But an essential um, element of the plan was that he wasn't trying to do deals with the extremists. He recognized the, the, the stratified nature of the regime and he was targeting those moderates that he, that he knew, people who, with whom he had, had worked during the 1980s. He was against the bombing because he knew that, that his points of reference, the moderates he'd worked with or commanded, would disperse, would disperse leaving the extremists manning the guns. Now, if you bomb a country, everything changes overnight. Um, unfortunately, the West not only failed to understand the stratified uh, nature of the regime and was sort of lumping everyone together, the good guys and the bad guys, and they really failed to understand that the Arabs and the hard hardliners were a slim minority, and many were decent Afghan nationalists. Abdul Haq also knew that bombing Taliban front lines would enable the Northern Alliance to take Kabul essentially alone and with no Pashtun bolster to the south and east. This would make way for the lopsided political settlement that in fact has taken place and enabled the Northern Alliance to take the key power ministries back in 2001 and has contributed to the alienation that most Pashtuns have felt from, from the state. Sadly, 
as we all know, Huck's warnings about the bombing campaign were ignored. John Gunston, who was one of the British trying to get support for Abdul Haq, and who went to visit him in Rome immediately after 9-11, where he met with the, the various commanders, and then went to Peshawar before Huck went in on his last mission, said, said to me, it's crazy, you have this today, yet in Rome you had Pashtuns, Tajiks, Uzbek, and Hazara leaders all ready to buy into the Huck strategy. What he was talking about, he said, the, it's crazy you have this um, Panjshiri nonsense today. And you had all these other groups who were willing to, pr to buy in to provide a, a more equal settlement. This is the um, Taliban deputy interior minister who has, was actually assassinated in 2006, sadly. Uh, but he was one of the people who was um, wanting to, to bring some of his units over to, to Abdul Haq's side. And he told me when I interviewed him in 2004, he said a lot of people supported his plan, even in Paktia, Khost, Gardez, and throughout Afghanistan. And when I asked him actually why the Taliban had executed Abdul Haq so quickly, because of course he had gone in on his mission in October 2001 after the bombing started and was captured very quickly in the southeast and executed and possibly um, tipped off by um, ISI to the Taliban. When I asked him why he was executed so quickly by, by his boss actually, Mullah Razak, he said because if they had imprisoned him, he would have um, provided a rallying point for a revolution. And in my opinion, he'd be president of Afghanistan today. Um, but actually, I mean, my, you know, my interest is not who's gonna be president or who, who's not gonna be president. It wasn't so much about a power struggle for that. It was really about the kind of structure that Abdul Haq envisaged politically. And that's my interest. Um, as I said, much of my investigation was through these two groups of um, Westerners, uh, the Ritchie brothers in, in the US, who were lobbying for Abdul Haq and his plan way before 9-11. These two guys were um, signed up Republicans. They were Chicago options traders who made a lot of money. And they'd been partly brought up in Afghanistan. And in fact, they still run in NGO projects there in, in Jalalabad. And for, for those two years prior to 9-11, they had been working hard. Um, they, wanted to, they had helped to finance some of the meetings in, in Istanbul and in Bonn and um, were wanting to provide logistical support in terms of sat phones and, and vehicles. Um, when Abdul Haq started his uh, rebellion in the East. They, they'd also been lobbying a lot with Bud McFarlane here in Washington, D.C., and in fact were due to have a meeting on the morning of 9-11. Um, they thought that despite the fact they hadn't been able to rally much interest uh, prior to 9-11, that when 9-11 happened that this would change and people would become interested, and they talk about a well, Joe Ritchie talks about a platter. I couldn't imagine a platter more ideally loaded, he said, talking about Abdul Haq, you know, a, about a solution that didn't uh, require uh, US military involvement, uh, had already been worked out, um, was fairly equal, um, and yeah, was there for the taking, basically. So why was this important? Now, this is a great photograph. I don't know if you know who this guy is um, with the henna colored beard. Uh, that's Jalaluddin Haqqani uh, and Abdul Haq in 1991 when Abdul Haq had organized the Shura of the Commanders in Barakshan just before the fall of Kabul from um, President Najibullah's communist regime. And Abdul Haq was bringing together uh, these various commanders of different Mujahideen factions to, to discuss how they were going to have a sort of handover or transfer of security in, in Kabul and to make an agreement between the various sides, which unfortunately Masood apparently broke because he went into Kabul uh, too quickly trying to, to stave off Hikmatia, who was coming from the other direc direction. But Jalal Abdin Haqqani uh, trusted Abdul Haq. He had trained him in uh, guerrilla warfare techniques in the early 1980s. And of course, they were part of the Hizbi Islami, the same party. And um, he comes from the Zadran tribe. I mean, obviously, we're reading about these guys every day in the newspapers uh, now. But this was a tribe that was um, very pro the monarchy, very conservative, and very against any form of foreign intervention. And they, you know, they'd obviously, they were key um, 
commanders in the 1980s against the Soviets and are now providing a lot of the problems um, that the US and NATO are facing today cross-border in the Af AFPAC region. Um, but I believe that uh, that if there was any way that Haqqani was going to come in, it would have been with Abdul Haq's plan. And unfortunately, when Abdul Haq was killed, Haqqani then, he went, he met with the ISI in Islamabad, and possibly since then, he has been, um, well, as we're reading, working with, with the ISI, working semi-independently, when no one's quite sure exactly to what degree they're autonomous. Um, but the plan was the ultimate Taliban reconciliation. The ex-king was needed for unity. He was needed symbolically to bring the structure. He was just going to be there in a transitional phase, though. He wasn't, it wasn't intended to restore the monarchy, necessarily. But Abdul Haq wanted him to be there, at least during that transitional period, to bring the groups together. And even General Massoud, or Commander Massoud, had agreed to this. And I'm just reading from my book here. At a historic meeting in Hoja Baudin, Dushanbe, in July 2001, this Pashtun hero of the war met with Commander Massoud, otherwise known as the Tajik hero of the war, and they came to a mutually acceptable agreement. Above all else, Haq desired a united Afghanistan. Okay, so the, this was also, of course, going to be an internal solution that not only would have obviated the need for a, a Western military adventure, but actually depended on the absence of the Western bombing campaign. It recognized the, stru the stratified nature and s of, of support for the Taliban and took advantage of that. It was also our best chance of bringing on board the Haqqanis, and it was the kind of agreement made over tea and nuts the night before the so-called battle that relied on more traditional internal legitimacy. So why did the West not support this plan? As I've said, I'm not going into detail about what we did instead. Um, you can read about that in um, the paper in the, in, in the December 2010 uh, edition of the International Review of the Red Cross. I can give you references later on that. But basically, the, the West seemed to prefer the short-term policy of using the Northern Alliance as a proxy, failing to recognize it was thus taking sides in an ongoing civil war. Neither the, the Northern Alliance nor the US, you know, except for Massoud possibly, I mean, but elements of, of the Shura Nazar after 9-11, neither, neither of them wanted the king back, yet he was to be there only in a transitional phase, uh, ensuring buy-in from all groups and that the right structure could be in place. Uh, the last reason was Pakistan. This went back to the 1980s and the ISI, had never enjoyed Haq's criticism of their policy of favoring the most extremist of the Mujahideen leaders like Hekmatya and Sayaf when it came to handing out some of the US uh, war chest during the 1980s. This is something that Abdul Haq had, had been very candid in his criticism about. Um, I, although ironically, Haq was not a Pashtun nationalist seeking to renegotiate the Durand Agreement which is something that the ISI and, and the Pakistan has been very nervous about since the 1970s. So, uh, it, I mean, it seems that ISI belittled him and the CIA agents who were there during the 1980s kind of took their cue from that. I see, okay, I'm just gonna... John, can you just go back? <laughs> it's a bit hard to go back the slides. So what are the ways forward? In 2001, Afghanistan was a failed state. It pretty, it pretty much still is today. Oh, what's going, okay, he's kind of coming there. When dealing with state failure, we need to think more long-term. In such instances, a bombing campaign is not necessarily helpful. We need to understand the divisions within Afghan society which remain as relevant today as during the communist period. For example, the urban mod modernizers versus the, the more tribal elements, the rural people. The West needs to understand and work more with traditional legitimacy in tribal countries, not just with ideas of capacity building and the, the Westphalian nation state model. For example, for this to work, sorry, um, the other, another issue to take account of is that Abdul Haq had advocated that the strongmen and Taliban who had committed rights abuses during earlier phases of the conflict should be held to account. 
The West failed to do this and instead has midwived a culture of impunity since 9-11 in Afghanistan. I mean, you, you notice that in other interventions like in the Balkans and in Syria, Sierra Leone, there was always a, a process of, um, call it truth and reconciliation or um, justice, but we, we, haven't, we haven't had that. We haven't supported that at all since 9-11. There are lots of what ifs. But certainly, the situation in Afghanistan today is far more conflict, complex than it was in 2001. I believe Abdul Haq foresaw the chaos that would unfold if the West set out on the path it has. This is why he went in, some say prematurely, on his mission, and why he was concerned with getting the right structure in place before he died, i.e. an internal peace plan based on agreements between the various groups. A plan that would not put Afghanistan on a collision course between internal and external sources of legitimacy. I believe what he tried to achieve would have avoided the need for a Western-style military intervention and enabled Afghan-style governance to take root instead of the corruption we have seen associated with military aid and spending. The West also needs to understand better the context of fragile societies before engaging with them particularly in re relation to traditional forms of legitimacy and customary arrangements in expanding the reach, power, and, effect and effectiveness of the state. To date, we have just dismissed such arrangements as too complex. The Taliban have understood the relevance of such arrangements and made use of them. Only this type of customary governance will secure space in Afghanistan in the longer term, not military occupation, the buying off of regional strongmen, and uh, bolstering these, these militias that we're doing in the regions at the moment. And I believe that, that this has relevance for the, for the Arab Spring, that we need to understand our failures, our mistakes in Afghanistan before we start heading headlong into some of these other fragile societies in, in the Middle East. So that's my little introduction. <laughs> if you've got any questions. All right, well, let's uh, thank you very much for that presentation, um, which is, is very provocative. Um, let me start by asking you what you mean by the Western consensus. As I read your writings and we've heard you today, um, it doesn't sound to me at least like you're distinguishing, it, it sounds to me like you are saying the Western consensus really has two parts. Um, one, a militarized approach to problem solving but then secondly, the state-centric nature of the international development community, and you almost see, you, you seem to portray these two as kind of wedded at the hip and really essentially working together. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, well, I think one of the problems is that actually the military campaign seems to have proceeded entirely independently of what was happening politically in Afghanistan. The, the, the two weren't really um, together. I think that there were problems with both. I think that the in terms of our political engagement. I mean, I've discussed this in detail in my book. I start off with the emergency lawyer Jergo in 2002, um, <coughs> where I was an election monitor, and where despite um, some fairly democratic processes in the district level elections before that uh, Grand Council of Elders, we call it, um, the actual meeting itself was, ended up being a complete charade where the, um, the U.S. ambassador at the time, um, Zalmay Khalilzad, and the U.N. Um, essentially allowed a lot of the governors and strongmen to come into the meeting uh, where, supported by the National Security Directorate, they were enabled to intimidate a lot of de democratically elected candidates into voting um, the way that they wanted. So I feel that, yes, there have been many elements of the uh, political process that have not been clear to people here in, in the US and, and back in Europe who've been funding um, this Afghan adventure, that we've, we've all believed that it was for the rights of women and for democracy. Um, but there, because there was no rule of law at the outset, this wasn't supported or taken seriously uh, democracy had no chance of taking hold. But I, I evolved my own um, feelings on this because I was somewhat of a naive idealist perhaps at the beginning. I, I, I felt that there was really a chance for a kind of Western-style democracy 
But the more I, the more time I spent, and particularly as I went to Jalalabad and spent time in these tribal areas in the east, I began to realize that a Western-style democracy wasn't appropriate at all um, in a country which is largely rural um, and is still predominantly rural. Um, most people live in rural areas, um, although there, of course, is a very vocal population in the center and, and cities um, who would, would, would quite like this. But uh, so, yeah, sorry, that's a bit of a long answer there. No, no, the long, it, these, are, these are hard questions. Um, we've read a lot about the you know, the inability of the U.S. military in particular to understand the political dynamics with which it's dealing, uh, probably more in the Iraq literature than in the Afghan literature. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that's pretty well documented. Um, we haven't seen quite as much on the, you know, on the centralized nature of the international development community. Can you expand, you know, why? Why are, you know, people with, you know, degrees in development who come from, you know, these quite respectable NGOs um, in, in your account, kind of complicit in this non-political understanding of Afghanistan? I think that every intervention, every, every country context is different. And one of the things that um, one of the Arsula brothers said to me is, you cannot apply the lessons to Bo of Bosnia to Afghanistan. You have to understand every different country in its context. And my feeling, in fact, something that I explored through the book, but also in this, this paper that I did on state building in Afghanistan, is that uh, the West has been predominantly concerned with building the kind of society, the kind of state, i.e. the sort of Westphalian nation state model that it is familiar with, that, that we believe works. But we are kind of failing to take account of the fact that our societies have evolved over hundreds of years. And um, we are dealing with a tribal society, as I keep saying. And there is definitely a tension um, within Afghanistan, between Afghans, but also, I think, in the international community between those kind of modernizers and those traditionalists. And uh, I, from my, what I found was quite a lot of the modernizers, and particularly amongst them Afghans, tended to be people who, had been, who were in the Afghan diaspora, who'd been living in the West, who had been educated in the West, working in the West, and were coming back to Afghanistan, maybe hadn't been there during the 1980s, and wanted to sort of impose their sort of ideal of this nation state onto that society. And um, it was just, they weren't really able to take those people in, in these remote rural communities with them on that. Um, you, you talked about the uh, ANSF strategy, the Afghan National Security Force strategy. Um, and uh, you, you, were, you were quite dismissive of it, but, but moved very quickly through it. Could you unpack that a little bit? What's, what's wrong with ISAF's approach to ANSF development, and why do you think that that strategy is uh, ultimately not going to work? I think there's so much focus on this ANSF, this Afghan National Security Forces, how we're going to transition out by just handing over to these guys. And I, I feel that there's little um, understanding of just how flimsy this structure is. That, I mean, not only is it still predominantly perceived to be dominated um, uh, by the Tajiks and by people from the north with not enough Pashtun representation, for example, in the, in the National Army, but that, that Afghans, I feel, are they're very fearful about what's going to happen when the West pulls out and that somehow that they're not going to be able to sustain this. I mean, we have to understand that there are forces both within the country and certainly in surrounding countries in the region that are going to um, predicate against this um, Afghan national security um, forces bolster to President Karzai. Um, of course, Pakistan, Iran, you know, we've got all these countries around who are, who are sort of adding, adding fuel to, to that fire. Um, but I feel that also there's, there seems to be a kind of lacking, um, there's not enough legitimacy in the government itself, I believe, to, to prop itself up um, and through, through these forces. And I understand that the government of President Najibullah managed to survive three years after the pullout of the Soviets. Uh, and I met, I've met Afghans who've told me that they came back from living abroad just to join the army in order to support President Najibullah and keep him in power. And you know, I, I, I believe that that's because they were kind of pro this idea of, of, of what some the Soviets had done and the modernization and so on. But 
with the Karzai government, the lack of corrupt, with the amount of corruption, um, the, the difficulties with impunity, with the unpopular strongmen who have been dominating uh, the setup since 2001 and 2002, where they were legitimized by the international community at the lawyer Jirga, I believe that the government doesn't have the popularity to sort of start drawing Afghans back from the diaspora to actually prop it up uh, with the army. Okay. Um, as we both know, there's, there's extensive literature, um, both you know, popular and, and academic, on issues of democracy and multi-ethnic societies, how difficult that is to set up, on the, the very real problems of aid dependency, particularly in a country that doesn't have a very large GDP, um, on the contested nature of non-state spaces, which you've, you've referred to here. Um, again, I'm, just, I'm gonna, I guess I'm re-asking the same question. I'm gonna try to draw you out. You know, the people who are working these issues are not uneducated. You know, they, they have public policy and, and law degrees from very prestigious places. Presumably, they've been exposed to some of this literature. Why, in your opinion, do we have this theory practice gap? We know these practices aren't going to work, and yet we continue to implement them. I, I still believe that although a lot of the people are very educated who are involved, um, who may be civilian advisors in these PRTs, um, I think the model is predominantly a sort of external-led state-building process. And it's, it's predominantly the West trying to put its vision of how things can develop onto Afghanistan. And recently, I, I was doing a presentation with another author who's just written uh, a book on Afghanistan. And she'd said that she was horrified when someone from the State Department talked about Afghanistan as being a sort of tablet. Uh, he's talking about a Roman tablet of, of wax where, you, where you, they used to um, scroll um, their, their kind of maths for the buying things in the market. But she, she said that this State Department employee had actually said Afghanistan's great because we're just starting from scratch. You know, as though there's nothing there uh, for the West or for these Western interveners, these Western um, kind of state builders to deal with, as though because we don't understand the nature of this complex tribal society, we're assuming that it doesn't exist. So we don't deal with it, we don't engage with it, we come and we bring um, our opinions and our um, ideals and we implement them largely, I think, also through, through the military or, I mean, certainly this is the perception in Afghanistan that a lot is being done, done uh, through, through military, through armed men and um, that we ignore what has traditionally existed there because it's either too complex for us to understand or because we don't understand the languages and so on. And I think that's, that's a huge problem. Do you think that part of the problem is the people who are, who are implementing this? When you get military officers who, you know, who, who live on a Weberian concept of the state and the, the military having a monopoly on the, the legitimate use of armed force, and couple them with aid workers who largely come from Washington and Brussels, you know, the, the center of pulling power to the center. Um, is, is that part of the problem? Do they just naturally want to bring power to a capital? I think the problem is definitely the time span and the impatience, um, particularly that uh, not just the US but NATO has, that, that they have spent so much money in Afghanistan, they've been there for a decade, they want to get out. Um, and they want to see quick results. But the problem is this has been the case from the beginning. They've wanted to see quick results. They haven't looked upon this in the medium to long term. They've wanted to stage elections despite the fact there was no rule of law, so they couldn't ever be proper elections. And these elections seem to have been staged more for the um, appeasement of the domestic populations in, in, in the US and in, in Europe than their sort of real applicability to the situation on the ground in Afghanistan. And I think, secondly, that yes, the military has definitely um, predominated in this, what you call a sort of 3D triangle of defense, diplomacy, and development. The military has dominated um, and has uh, been able to gradually militarize um, aid. And this is certainly the case um, since I was first there in Kandahar during the Taliban, where we could really travel in, in the countryside. We could travel anywhere in a, in a very secure environment, but we were it was very important that we didn't travel with, um, with guns or armed men in our vehicles because that was considered in, uh, inducing yourself to become a target. That's all changed now. And, um, you know, I've had Afghans tell me, well, you know, the UN 
what do they think they're doing? They're, they're traveling on American helicopters and they are um, becoming far too much associated with one side in, in, in the conflict. So I think, yes, that's definitely a militarization of, of the aid and development sector is, is a big problem and very confusing for the Afghans. How much does this, this theory of development that you, you bring up rely on having the right local leader? Or to rephrase, you know, once Abdul Haq was killed, um, did this plan effectively die with him? Was there an opportunity to implement this in early 2002, even after his death? Or was that just no longer politically practical with him no longer there to hold it together? I think it's partly that he, yes, he was definitely a very credible leader. Um, he was very well known for bringing different sides together and building consensus and having people talk. But I think the other problem was definitely uh, when the bombing campaign started and things changed and uh, the Northern Alliance were enabled to bomb through Taliban front lines and to flow into Kabul and take uh, the key power ministries. So um, from that time, it was quite difficult for the West to, to reverse the mistakes that it had made. And this was definitely something he'd foreseen. I, I remember people in the British Embassy in January 2002 saying that, that Sayaf had his, his rockets aimed at Kab Kabul and, you know, from Pagman and how are they going to roll this back and, and tell him to sort of kind of back off and that this was, you know, basically impossible for them. Um, so these, these guys, these strong men have been in the driving seat since um, the, the um, Western military campaign and since they were able to take those ministries, take the security apparatus in Kabul and the various um, army units. And then again, they, this was underscored by um, the legitimiz le legitimization that they were given politically by the West at the emergency lawyer jirga, which I had attended. And in fact, just to illustrate, on the eve of the lawyer jirga, which took place in the Polytechnic in Kabul in uh, June 2002, I remember the UN had flown in something like 1,200 candidates from around the country. And these warlords suddenly arrived. They literally crashed through um, the ISAF um, cordons with their, with their um, big cars and their bodyguards and their arms, which was strictly banned on the site. And I remember some of them came out of their cars and, and went towards a, a tented area. Some of the women who'd been elected were basically saying to them, what are you doing here? You know, why are you here? You're the people who destroyed our country. Go away. Um, and there was a real belief that, that they weren't going to be able to take part in the state building process, that their time had finished. They'd been in exile during the Taliban. And I felt that, you know, Afghans really thought that the West was going to somehow support them in this transition to democracy and um, women's rights, although I think the women's issue is very nuanced. Um, but unfortunately, that, that's not what happened. Um, you've emphasized the importance of local knowledge. So if you want to defer on this next question, I'll let you. But as mm -hmm. you sit and listen to your presentation, you can't help but think of Libya. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, a, a very similar phenomenon, a use of air power, lots of bombing, um, you know, the centralizing of power in Tripoli, although there's you know, some, you know, some emphasis, you know, the original uh, rebels in Benghazi. Um, what are your specific thoughts on Libya, given your, uh, your, your re research for this book? I mean, I was actually pro the intervention in Libya because I think it was clear that Gaddafi was threatening those people in Benghazi. Um, however, I have to, to say that, that every intervention is different. And um, in Afghanistan, I mean, Libya seems to be you know, quite an opaque country. I mean, I'm, not, I'm no expert of North Africa. But there were people, particularly people here in Washington, D.C., and people in London, who really should have known who the players were on the ground in Afghanistan, having had this engagement with that country during the 1980s, um, during the war against the Soviets. So um, just that point aside, I think, I think uh, we have to be careful with Libya not to, again, impose our, our idea of the westernized style democracy that you know we have to step back and allow them if they want Sharia law um, to to sort that out for themselves. I mean, obviously, um, the West has engaged and has has allowed um, one group 
to predominate. There's, there is a danger of a civil war there. But um, I think we, I, I get concerned when I hear reports on the radio of, gosh, you know, everyone's up in arms because the Libyans are going to have Sharia law. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's a great danger of, of making that mistake um, if, we, if we interfere too much in that. Um, to, for our, our last little conversation here before we go to the audience, um, if you could just re-summarize then what you think are the key lessons going forward. Um, you know, what do policymakers need to think about in these states that, you know, whether because of external intervention or because of internal causes, are, are going through some form of regime change, um, will have to go through a you know, post-authoritarian rule transition? Um, what do we take forward? I think um, what we have to take forward is we have to think long term in these places. You just can't go in and do the quick fix, the quick bombing, and then get out. Um, there was a real assumption, I think, when the Taliban fell that you know we, everyone could pat themselves on the back and move on to Iraq. Um, you have to think long term. Uh, you have to, I think we have to really uh, look away from the military lens. We have to start looking at these societies in their whole and look from the bottom up instead of trying to impose from top down our vision primarily through um, a bombing campaign. Um, I think in Afghanistan it would have been actually far more effective if we'd had this process of transitional justice and rounded up some of these guys or at least uh, not allowed them to, to shape the outcome of, of the state and to retreat back to their fiefdoms um, after being in exile during the Taliban and um, allow them to then sort of reassume control in those fiefdoms and then contribute to this crisis of impunity, which is what it's become. Um, so I think, yes, less, less military domination, um, much longer term, and a great necessity to start understanding, to look at the academics who write more about these um, ideas of um, customary governance, traditional legitimacy, hybridized governance mechanisms. And this is more the sort of Shura, the Jirga process, um, to understand how these can contribute to stability. And um, I've, I've, this is something I've touched upon again, I've repeated again this, this article I wrote for the um, Review of the Red Cross, which is a special edition on Afghanistan. It's called Conflict in Afghanistan. You can find it on the internet if you just Google ICRC and my name. Um, because I think this is a really fascinating area um, that has been so ignored in the last 10 years. Um, and I think this is where, this is the future that we have to, to really look much more deeply and not to try to dominate, but to work more with what is there. Great, thank you. Um, at this time, we'll turn to audience questions. Um, when I call on you, please uh, state your name and your affiliation after the microphone. You have a microphone? All right. Wait for the microphone. Please state your name and affiliation, and then please ask Miss um, Edwards your question. I ask that it be a question. You're entitled to a sentence or two of set up, but we don't have time for you know thirty uh, you know thirty seconds of your uh, you know your own personal political views on something. And uh, we'll start in the back here, the blue shirt, right next to where the microphone is. My name is Alexis Sapchenko, and I'm representing here myself. My question is very simple. In case we're going to withdraw from Afghanistan, would the option of dividing Afghanistan in two parts, meaning northern part and Pashtunistan, would it be a viable option at all? Thank you. Are you taking a few? Go ahead. Um, I, I think that that's a bit of a sort of, this was an idea, I think it was mooted about a year ago in, in Foreign Affairs magazine. Um, I, I don't think that, that this is a solution, really. I mean, you've still got this problem of um, the Pashtunistan issue and the Durand line with, with Pakistan. And I think that is the real root of the problem rather than a difficulty so much between the Tajiks and the Pashtuns. I think Pakistan is the more significant problem there and this, um, the issue of, of the Durand line, which, which hasn't been resolved. Uh, next to the door here. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Edward, for the uh, lecture. Uh, uh, my question is about I'm sorry, the. Your name? Oh, Please. my name is Said. I'm a student at Georgetown University, and also working at the embassy. Uh, my question is about Akani. I mean, like since Akani and Abdullah had such a great relationships, and uh, probably uh, Abdullah was the one who could bring Akani to the table of negotiations. Uh, 
now that he's gone and Akani has uh, uh, basically taken a completely separate sides against the uh, government and also against the foreign invasion of Afghanistan, do you think we should kill or capture Akani or maybe talk to him? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, the, the, this, the kill and capture um, scheme, um, again, focusing on numbers killed rather than bringing people to the negotiating table, it's, I mean, for personally, I feel that that's, that, that, that's not the way ahead. Um, of course, Haqqani, we're now talking about his son, Sirajuddin, and the younger generation who are much more extremist and difficult to engage with. And I think this is part of the problem of the last 10 years where things have become, it's like entropy law. Things have just become way more complicated. Um, the older generation were not brought up in refugee camps necessarily and were not a generation who'd only known war throughout their lives and had more of that tradition of coming together and consensus and, 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 and talking. Um, personally, I think that, uh, you know, if you, even if you kill and capture Sirajuddin Haqqani, um, I would imagine that there are 50 more Haqqanis out there who are going to fill his shoes. So um, I think we, I really think we have to change our approach. I don't believe that the kill or capture is the way ahead. I think it creates more anger. Um, it, it creates more extremists. I've heard from people on the ground um, in that area in Waziristan, particularly um, and Paktia, that the younger generation of commanders you know, when Westerners um, approached them, I mean, previously, of course, there was a huge amount of hospi hospitality, and some of the journalists in the 80s who, who spent time with the Haqqanis, who have gone back now, um, who say that, you know, the younger generation just don't even want to be in the same room, uh, that there's so much anger now. So I, I, I don't agree with this sort of policy of attrition. I think we have to think our way around this more intelligently. Right here, in the brown uh, leather. Hi, I'm Taylor Johnson from the Institute for the Study of War. Uh, you talked a little bit about uh, Massoud today. I was hoping to ask you about that. Um, so Massoud was known for holding this band of, of these northern commanders together, a very charismatic leader. Mm -hmm. Would the Hawk plan have still been feasible after he was assassinated shortly before 9-11? Thanks. Of course, that's the $61,000 question. Um, and also, would Masood have kept to his word that he had given in Dushanbe in, in the summer of um, 2001 um, at this meeting that was recorded by Ambassador Peter Thompson, um, one of your State Department people, um, in his book, uh, and also by James Ritchie, who was also present. And I think the two of them had disappeared and left Abdul Haq and Masood to talk together uh, that evening. and. Um, I heard from them that Masood had given his word that he would buy in with this plan and that he would accept the return of the king, despite the fact that the king hadn't always been a popular figure with people in the Northeast. Um, would things have changed? I think what made uh, things less feasible was, again, the bombing campaign, which, again, handed those ministries to Fahim, who, who stepped into sh to, um, Masood's boots, es essentially. Um, and my, Fahim was a very different animal. But I think possibly without that bombing campaign, and if the Pashtuns had been able to, to reach Kabul, if Abdul Haq had been able to reach Kabul, and be able to um, engage those commanders, that not just in the um, three division in Kabul, but also in, in Hezarat, Ghazni, Gardez, and even over in Kandahar with Mullah Malang's people, um, that I think things, this, things would have been very different. So yeah, again, it, it comes back to um, how we just handed so much of the power um, to the no Northern Alliance through, through the bombing, and that, that just turned the tables and um, made it difficult to, 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 to go back from those power seekers, essentially. In the very back. Uh. <laughs> Uh, my name is Sayyad. I am an Afghan journalist from Kandahar. And my English is not good. I have two questions. And I <laughs> hope I am able to you understand my English. Uh, <coughs> as you also said that you also work in Kandahar, and I also work with the mm, Western propaganda media. Uh, I also work with the UNAMA there. You mentioned that uh, King was not popular 
in or the Northern Alliance and as well as U.S. did not want it. In Pashto, we have a proverb that <laughs> I never saw a grand, uh, uh, you know, stepmother kinder than my real mother. Most of the Western writers who write about us, and they usually just take this issue of uh, our ethnic division. And usually everywhere there are ethnic divisions in every part of the world. But still it does not existed the way Western exaggerate about it. My question is, when the king was, <laughs> I was part of the Yunama in Kandahar, there were surveys in all over Afghanistan. He was very popular. Nobody could win from it. And uh, Ambassador Zulmay Khalilzad, you know, we covered this issue that he forced him not to be candidate for Loya Jarga. This one question, why the West and the United States did not want him to be candidate? My second question is, of course, uh, do you think, I mean, many people think the United States will declare this war as a war because it's a shameful defeat. So do you also agree that they will declare it as a victory? Thanks. I think it's, very, it's going to be difficult for them to declare it as a victory. I think probably they're going to shift the goalposts when, when they leave and, and um, just say that uh, you know, it's a stable country and that they're able to leave, handing over to Afghan National Security Forces. Um, why didn't they want the king? Um, I mean, I've talked to, to various people about this. I was also there at the lawyer Jirga when, when the king arrived and he um, went onto the podium to give his speech after having been away several decades from Afghanistan and the um, microphone was cut off and he wasn't able to um, speak to his people. Um, and the same thing had happened when he came off the plane um, from Rome. Uh, the microphone mysteriously cut off and he wasn't able to speak. And the way the king was treated, I think, was shameful by the West. Um, I think this was largely because, um, I mean, Francesc Vandrell, who I used to work for, um, who was who had been the head of UNAMA, UNSMA, as it was um, prior to 9-11, uh, who was actually, I think, quite keen on, on the return of the king. Um, he said that the US never wanted the king to take a role. And I, I, I would imagine that this also has to do with the, um, the fact that those Tajik factions, the Northern Alliance, um, after the bombing campaign also didn't want the return of the king. I think that there's been quite a lot of antipathy towards the king uh, by some of those um, small minorities of the Northeast and particularly the Panjshir. And I would imagine that this relates to um, feeling threatened by his popularity because he, he certainly seemed to be seen as a very popular symbolic figure or someone who had presided over 40 years of peace um, and uh, relative stability in Afghanistan until he was um, deposed in, in 1973. I hope that answers the question. I've been in Afghanistan several times, <coughs> but I don't know nearly enough enough about it. Um, quick question, is Karzai, um, uh, perceived as a Western uh, plant or uh, agent, uh, as he, he may have covered this already, sorry if you did, uh, and is, cor is the corruption level uh, in Kabul s widely known all over the country? We all hear about it all the time. Is it, is it a factor in the political debate and is Karzai considered legitimate Afghan leader? I mean, I've, I've dealt in my book with Karzai and, and how he came to be where he is today and at what stage there might have been some kind of agreement with, with the Bush administration. Um, I mean, Karzai, I think, certainly does not appear from conversations I've had with people to have been someone of any great standing, certainly not to the extent of Abdul Haq. Um, Abdul Haq, of course, was a national figure who's very well known for his bravery and his uh, strategic um, cleverness during the 1980s in his operations. Karzai was basically pretty um, junior at that stage. Um, I think that uh, certainly um, possibly the CIA and, and uh, people here in the Bush administration wanted someone that they felt would be on message. Uh, Abdul Haq was um, well known to be quite outspoken, quite critical during the 1980s and, and even thereafter when he was writing letters to ambassadors and to leaders in Western countries warning them about the, um, the camps that were being built along the, the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan, the arrival of the Arab fighters, the proliferation of fake IDs. 
he, you know, he made a noise about this, and he, he, he wasn't just prepared to do what he was told and uh, shut up. And I do feel that, that that's partly, and of, of course, the, um, the undermining of him in, in terms of guys in the CIA saying Abdul Haq has baggage, Abdul Haq is not capable, Abdul Haq um, is just Hollywood hack because he likes speaking to the journalists. I mean, I, some of the guys that I interviewed in, in Britain who were trying to bring support for him for, through, uh, in our various intelligence agencies and in Whitehall in October and September 2001, some of these guys had traveled extensively in Afghanistan during the 1980s, and um, including Ken Guest, who is a very interesting character. He was a cameraman. He's covered all these wars um, throughout these several decades, written books about medieval warfare, and he's an ex-Marine in the British Army. And um, he, was, he dis discussed with me quite extensively what he felt was the demeaning of Abdul Haq um, by characters in the CIA in the mid-'80s. Um, and Ken, of course, was in, in country. He wasn't sitting in Islamabad. And he talked about, um, for example, the blowing of this munitions dump in Karga, a seven-story underground munitions dump of, of the Soviets, um, which Abdul Haq had blown with a single rocket, apparently, after six months of planning, and which the CIA station chief at the time uh, refused to acknowledge that, that, that this was Abdul Haq. You know, he was saying, oh, all these commanders were claiming that they did it. That was enough for me. Um, but you know, really, I think that the CIA were, had a duty to really know who were the effective guys to be working with. Because you know, this was American money, American tax dollars, and um, Afghan blood. Um, and I think it was incumbent upon them to really know who were the, the most effective players. And I think they failed in that. And I think after 9-11, uh, Ken, for example, cited to me how he'd been behind the camera filming a meeting with Hamid Gul of the ISI, former chief of the ISI, and uh, well, no, he was actually filming this particular CIA, ex-CIA station chief, and he'd asked him casually if he could give him Hamid Gul's telephone number, and um, ten years after this guy had left the theatre, he was able to roll off Hamid Gul's phone number straight off his tongue after 9-11. And so Ken said this, this proved to me that he was still in regular contact with the ISI and that you know, basically it seemed like the CIA was still basically taking their direction from the ISI. And I, I think that um, that has is, that is really contributed to quite a large part of the problem we see today. Corruption today. Corruption level. Yeah, corruption, I mean, definitely. Corruption, it took the West a long time to realize what was going on with the corruption. Um, I mean, it was even very evident in 2004, 2005, and it was not acknowledged. Um, I, I remember being in a meeting with um, donors, and at that stage I was working for the European Union office, and we had compiled various um, reports of um, drug hauls that were being um, intercepted by NATO, and when there was possibly a call from a high level, um, and that these had to be then let go. Uh, this is just one example. Um, then, of course, there's the, the, the example of Sherpur, the land on the old British cantonment being parceled up um, by Fahim and, and um, sold off or given away to, to, as sinecures to other ministers. Um, but corruption seems to be reaching every level of society, and I think this is why um, somehow the Taliban have been able to gain traction, because during the Taliban it wasn't such a corrupt time at all. You know, it was. I interviewed Haji Zaire, who was in jail in Kandahar for a couple of years during the Taliban period, and his father, Haji Ghadir, had sent $20,000 to him from the Panjshir Valley, and this was held by his captors. And I said, well, okay, they looked after your money, didn't they just steal it? And he was like, no. You know, every time I needed a packet of cigarettes, they'd give me the money and I'd send out to, to be, have the packet of cigarettes bought for me. He said they were simple but honest people. But I think now the corruption, it's, it's very much in league with sort of international mafia, and it's very difficult to, to, to reverse now. Very, very difficult. Right here. Yeah, my name is Li Yang, independent TV producers. I wonder what kind of policy or method of policy practice they have in order to develop a potential leaders? 
what I mean, capable leaders for the best interest of the public interest, you know, from local to national, not just uh, on the top. And the second is uh, how do they improve the transparency or accountability? Again, from local to national. Um, I think, well, the problem of leadership, it's, uh, I mean, largely, I think the problem for Karzai has been that he's, that he wasn't such a national figure. He didn't have a political party or, or much military um, support behind him of his own. And so he's had to, he's essentially almost had to barter sinecures in order to remain in power. He's had to barter um, positions, government positions, police chief positions, governor positions in the regions to these strong men in order to buy their support in the short term. And these are not the kind of people that you necessarily make the best leaders, either on a local level or on a national level. But the, the West has actually contributed to that problem because where, for example, we have PRTs or military bases in, in the regions, the primary objective of a lot of the base commanders has been force protection of their soldiers. So we, you know, where he's put in place these, these guys who are not um, necessarily the best leaders, um, we've just, in a way, we've, we've solidified their power. We've bolstered their power by working with them to protect routes, to protect or to, to, to hire land or to use their militia forces. So I think that's, that's one part of the problem. Transparency. Um, Again, I think while you have this situation of impunity, it's, it's very difficult to have any kind of decent institutions and um, any sort of transparency. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, interesting you know, speech. And uh, my name is Shoji Motoka from Johns Hopkins Science, and I'm former uh, Kabul Bureau Chief of uh, Japanese Public Television NHK. And once uh, our coverage team visited uh, the hospital in the Nangahe area before, and that hospital was you know built by the US PRT team recently. And we found uh, very little local people are using uh, that hospital. We ask a question: Why you, you don't use this hospital? Hospital. One reason is you know this is far from the residential area. The other reason is uh, you know they are afraid of, of a Taliban because visiting such kind of a U.S. built facility uh, is regarded as a kind of a supporter for U.S. They don't want to be labeled as a U.S. oriented to local people. So, but. Uh, of course, they need uh, this kind of a facility. They need a hospital, but they don't want a uh, U.S. built hospital. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how can you, you know, solve this kind of, uh, you know, problem? Uh, I mean, yes, uh, to build this country better. Thank you very much. Where was the hospital? Uh, Nagaha. 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 Okay. Nagaha. Yeah. I mean, this is a very nice example, exactly of the problem of um, the. Uh, militarization of aid and the aid industry and how this has all coalesced together over the last decade. Um, I, I mean, I believe we, we fail to understand the political consequences for local people of when we have um, Western military coming in and it's not just applied to hospitals but schools and um, courthouses and, and so on that uh, we, we, don't, we fail to understand that it's not so easy uh, if Western troops have built one of these structures that local people can immediately use it, that there could be reprisals against them by insurgent groups. Um, another factor, of course, is the cost. I mean, it is far more expensive to have Western troops building these things than, for example, some of the NGOs or humanitarian agencies who were working in Afghanistan prior to 9-11 who had the expertise um, I mean, my, my husband works at the ICRC, and um, he was quite surprised when he went to Herat and he was talking to the Italian PRT about the, um, the projects that they were doing. They were doing some water supply projects, and they told him what their budget was, and it was, it was a very big budget. And he was very surprised, and he said, you know, he told me that they previously would have done that for a fraction of the price. So, you know, it's inefficient to have the military um, building building hospitals and schools and, and doing water supply projects and so on um, because of course you have to pay for each soldier that does it rather than aid workers and um, of course I mean by comparison or by contrast with the 
types of projects that I was involved with before 9-11 when I worked for UN Habitat in Kandahar. At that stage, the UN and UNDP had um, developed uh, this mode of, of delivering um, development projects, which was very community-based. It was very bottom-up. It was all about the community being involved in designing the projects. And, and there was actually even a sort of formula, an algebraic formula, for how to select beneficiaries of the projects. So at that stage, there had been a three-year drought. Hundreds of thousands of people had been pushed off their land or had to leave their land because um, their crops had failed and they had sold all their assets. And there were refugee camps or IDP camps in Kandahar and Herat. And um, our projects were aimed at the most vulnerable people in the community, so widows and, and so on. But the community would select who those beneficiaries were. We weren't identifying them. Um, the community were very much engaged in that. And because of this, um, and in fact, one particular project I was working on, um, drought relief project, um, where we were literally having very vulnerable men um, shoveling shit out of the alleys between the, the streets, taking them to the kind of street corner, and then you'd have a municipal vehicle coming and picking it up, and then a dump truck. These projects were so popular, uh, even under the Taliban, that um, people were, after the UN funding ceased, were going to fund them there with their Islamic taxes. And so this is you know, the difference between the sort of top-down and the bottom-up um, development projects, which I think we need to re rethink completely. The blue suit here on the aisle. I'm Chris May. I'm uh, here as an independent figure. I'm a deeply worried grandfather about the course of so many things going on, and particularly about Afghanistan. If President Obama were to ask for your advice as to what to do now in terms of both the U.S. interests and the interests of the Afghans, what would you suggest to him? That's the $100,000 question in Washington in the next year, I think, as they run up to the elections. As I've said, I mean, part of the reason I wrote the book was because I felt that there was a window of opportunity after 9-11 that if we didn't recognize and grasp was going to slip away forever. And Abdul Haq essentially predicted, even in 1992, the... Um, the chaos that we see today in Afghanistan. He, he talked about if Mujahideen elements take control in Afghanistan, there will be war forever. And we Afghans will have to beg from the international community for the rest of our lives for, for support, for, for aid, uh, and so on. Um, there is no easy solution in Afghanistan. Um, we have got ourselves into such a mess there. We have wasted so much money there. We have ignored the advice of the people who knew. Um, the, the people, I mean, unfortunately, I think a lot of this went back to the desire for a fireworks display after 9-11, the, the, the appeasement of uh, the population here in the US um, because of the um, anger of the 9-11 attacks. But you just cannot deal with a failed state like that. You, you, you just can't. We have to be more intelligent about the way that we approach these countries. Um, and I think primarily that involves quitting this obsession with military action, with drones, with bombs, with um, fireworks displays. I think we have to be grown up and we have to talk to people. And we have to, to, to know who, we have to disaggregate the, the kind of characters that, that we, we really need to, to build these societies in the long term. And one of the brothers of this family that I stayed with, Abdul Hux, one of his seven brothers, who was trying to resurrect Ashura in um, Jalalabad after the death of Abdul Haq and then Haji Qadir. He said to me, part of the problem is that the, um, with the PRTs are, um, even though they're trying to work a bit more with the elders in these regions, they are paying these people. And this doesn't work in Afghan society, that you know, traditionally people would do this on a voluntary basis and that you are going to get, you're going to attract the, the, the best types of people, the, those who really want to help their communities, if you don't pay them, if you start paying them, you are immediately introducing an element of corruption and you're going to attract more the kind of strong men types. So I think, yeah, long term, less military, and really understand, understand who, the, who the players are on the ground. Did we learn nothing 
I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't seem like we've learned a lot. Right. Uh, in fairness, I think that was the $100 billion question, not the $100,000 question. Mm. Uh, in the brown in the back? Uh, yeah, hi, good afternoon. I'm Bob Dreyfus with The Nation magazine. Um, so if Pakistan wants to impose its will on Afghanistan, which seems to have been the theme of the past three decades, um, and the United States is basically beginning to close the door on our role there sometime in the next few years, um, doesn't that mean that Pakistan basically gets to do what it wants to? Um, they tried to impose their seven-party group several times since the 1980s and in various forms. The Indians, uh, I mean, it may be too strong to argue that Massoud was a stooge of the Indians, but he was certainly an ally of theirs and, and armed and died in one of their hospitals. Um, so what do we do about the India-Pakistan proxy war, uh, um, especially because most of the tribal structures that existed, if they ever existed in the 70s under the king and so on, have been decimated and destroyed and people have been assassinated by the, the hundreds and hundreds of elders, by the insurgents and others. So I don't know if there's any pieces to put back together there anymore. Yeah, of course. I mean, this announcement a couple of weeks ago that uh, this uh, cooperation agreement between India and Afghanistan, I think, was very provocative uh, to Pakistan. Um, this is, again, a huge factor uh, that India and Pakistan might continue to fight their proxy war using Afghanistan as a as sort of, well, I mean, Pakistan always talking about wanting to um, essentially um, have uh, more influence in Afghanistan for strategic depth reasons against India. I think we, yeah, we need to get back to the heart of the problem between India and, and Pakistan. And that might mean resolving, I mean, going back to looking at the Kashmir dispute. Um, because otherwise, I don't really see how we can, this can be resolved. I, th I think, I mean, obviously Pakistan is becoming a lot less stable. Um, things of, you know, th this to me, I mean, the nuclear issue there is, is, is very serious. Um, the issue of um, more and more extremists. But, you know, since 9-11, um, there has been investment in the military side by, by the U.S. with the pa Pakistani government, but not in education. And I think this, you know, it's got to come back to education. That in the, it, We have to look long term and we have to help these people to, to educate um, their populations. But we also perhaps need to apply travel sanctions on, on some of these figures, um, some of these so-called rogue ISI. I don't know how rogue they are or how much they represent the Pakistani state. Um, but this is a very intractable problem that you've, that you've highlighted. And uh, on the tribal issue, I think, yes, it's, it's, very, very, um, it's very difficult now that so many of these tribal leaders have been assassinated and, and assassinated by all sides, assassinated by Hikmatyar, assassinated by the communists, or the Soviets, by the Taliban. But I still believe that Afghans, in particularly in the south, in that southern Pashtun belt, which is our main focus of the insurgency, I still believe that they, they, um, they like to work with these structures, uh, that they prefer this approach to this idea of this top-down approach that, that we seem to have, this capacity building, this extension of st central government into the regions. I think we do need to start from ground level up, and um, we, 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 do, we, we shouldn't negate that, that tribal um, side of the equation. Just on, on Pakistan and education, I would just point out there's a very interesting recent paper by Christine Fair out of Georgetown and Jake Shapiro, I think he's at Princeton now, um, that points out that the more, uh, among more educated Pakistanis, there's higher support for armed insurgent groups than there is among the lower classes. That, um, so higher education, it, it's, it's more complex than just yeah. educating people. Um, I, th I thought I saw another hand. Any more questions? Going one, uh, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm loud. 
Like have a loud voice. Uh, please take the mic anyway. For, we need oh, for okay. people who are uh, not here. Just a correction. Uh, Commander Masood was died on the spot, and he did not die in a in an Indian uh, uh, hospital, and he was pronounced dead on the spot. And also another thing, I think once we are kind of like exacerbating the the ethnic kind of like divisions and the conflicts between the Tariqs and the Pashtuns, I think it's a little unfair, because. Uh, What's happening with the uh, assassination, for example, this chain assassination that's happening, it is, uh, even the Taliban are right now confused who is doing it. For example, like, I have never heard or even uh, read about it that uh, a Tajik group uh, coordinated an assassination of a uh, Pashtun uh, leader, or a Pashtun leader uh, coordinated an assassination of... Question? I'm, I'm just asking about the question that how we can kind of like put the pressure more into where these kind of like the directions are coming from. For example, if we continue kind of like talk, bring for example, the, uh, those who are kind of uh, associated with the ISI, but we are just trying to bring them to the table of negotiations, but they are trying, to not, trying not to if their boss doesn't tell them to do so. And how we can kind of like convince them rather than kind of saying that, rather than blaming that the Panchiris or the Tajiks that, for example, just holding all the positions, as we can tell that the current the current government in Afghanistan is not uh, fully basically administered and run by the Tajik uh, uh, people. I, and also with the military, it's 43% of the military is the Pashtuns. It's not the Tajiks. It's very mixed kind of in terms of ethnic composition. All right. I, I think that just despite just <coughs> quoting of figures as to what what ethnic group is what, I mean, I think the question is, you know, do we put too much stock in he's a Tajik, he's a Hazara, he's a Pashtun? <coughs> um. I think um, I, I, I understand where you're coming from on that. But I, there was definitely a civil war going on before 9-11 in Afghanistan. And I was there and I remember... Um, for example, the staff in my office in Kandahar celebrating when um, the Taliban took the city of Talakan in the northeast. And, you know, I, I said to them, I was actually pretty shocked that my staff, who I thought were all these very educated people, that they all supported the Taliban. I'd assumed that they wouldn't. Um, so when, when um, I asked them why they were so happy that they'd taken Talakan, they said, because we'll soon win the war. And that means, you know, we'll have 100% of the country and then um, the Taliban will have to, they will have to supply us with education and health care um, instead of fighting against the Tajiks. Um, yes, I mean, things are very complicated now. And I mean, I, I'm not sure that we even know who was responsible for killing Rabani. Has, has that been resolved, that issue? Um, but you know, I would say that, yes, there's, there's definitely... I mean, my experience of the first five years was that there was a, an antipathy and a feeling of alienation by the Pashtuns that they didn't feel that they'd had fair representation in the political settlement in 2001 and 2002, that they apparently had been um, quite a lot of Pashtun leaders from the south who weren't able to attend the Bonn talks, um, a feeling that Brahimi had shut some of them out and not allowed them to participate, that they were somehow too much associated with the Taliban, um, the sort of black and white, you know, good guys and bad guys issue. So I think the West was a bit too, a, a bit too simplistic about that. Um, and there was certainly a feeling uh, amongst Tajiks that, uh, you know, we should be rewarded because we've got rid of the Taliban. Um, Whereas in, in possibly amongst some of the Pashtuns, it was a little bit more nuanced that, you know, some of them had joined the Taliban as a feeling of bringing stability or joining a movement that was bringing stability to clear out the warlords and the warlordism of the mid-1990s. So, and I'm not sure about the <coughs> figures on the army, but, you know, I, you know, it depends on the rate of attrition, and, but certainly there has been a feeling for quite a long time that the army <coughs> was quite heavily tudging. Great. If we can close, then I'd give you a, a you know final few minutes here to you know restate the thesis of your book, kind of bring us all wrap this up together, and you know what are you saying, and why should policymakers care? Okay, so I'm saying that uh, we need to revisit history. We need to understand the opportunities that we lost and where we went wrong in order to move on. Um, I you know I've had people, even even someone at the White House saying to me, well, you know, who cares? You know, I mean, we didn't quite say who cares, but he basically said, uh, um, come on, we, we just want to know how to get out. 
but it's not a, an easy, quick fix. You have to know where we went wrong in order to move ahead. So my book is really a documentation of that, of what I witnessed over those, those years, the turning points that I felt where the West had really squandered opportunities and what was the outcome of those um, opportunities lost. But also what I felt was an internal solution because we're now, we need to look for an internal solution in Afghanistan, although I think it's going to be pretty hard to find one. But I think um, it was an internal solution and uh, that it was pretty much reliant on... Um, well, of course, not on foreign intervention, which is very unpopular, which brings people together against, against the foreigner, um, but one that was very much focused on this idea of legitimacy at a local level. Uh, and I think that this is something that we've really just completely not looked at in the last 10 years in this, in this idea of this sort of very militarized and very technical approach to, to the war, this kinetic approach. And... Um, I think that we need to understand on the psychological level um, of the Afghans um, also how to, to deal with the situation because it's a war of perception. as It's not just a kinetic um, situation that we're in. So, uh, yeah, I, I leave it there for you. Thank you very much. Again, uh, Miss Edwards is the author of The Afghan Solution, The Inside Story of Abdul Haq, the CIA, and How Western Hubris Lost Afghanistan. We encourage you all to... Uh, pick up a copy, which are available outside. Uh, again, thank you for coming, and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> Thanks.